Author John Kuiper Liberty presents Gospel Theology, God's Good News for Everything, published by Westbow Press, Bloomington, Indiana, 2021, used with permission. Chapter 28, The Gospel and Adaptation. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23 Have you ever been to another country? If so, you know that it can feel unnatural. You have to think about things that would normally not enter your mind. Sometimes these things are quite extreme, like if the people speak a different language you do not understand. Or it could be something smaller, like the distinctive ingredients they use on their pizza, or a routine like having tea at a set time of the day. Or maybe they have interesting rituals at certain times of the year, and you will see them dancing in the streets, waving flags, or even bowing down to statues. Human beings share much in common across cultures, but we also have significant cultural differences. Our key biblical text for this chapter is a strategic plan from God. It is an example provided to us by God that helps us to understand how we are to go about spreading the love and good news of Jesus Christ to as many people as possible, even to those with different cultural backgrounds. This chapter will include a special vocabulary word, contextualization. Do not be intimidated. It is very easy to understand. Contextualization refers to how the context, culture, we are in should change the way we do things to accomplish a specified goal. If you have ever gone to Mexico and spoke some Spanish, you are engaging in a type of contextualization. If you have ever gone to a sporting event and wore clothes that you would not normally wear elsewhere, you are engaged in a type of contextualization. For a particular purpose, God has determined both the time and place of your birth and the place of your current life circumstances, Acts 17.26. Broadly, that purpose is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. One specific way to do that is to spread the glory of God and the gospel of Christ in your particular cultural context. Our call is to make and mature disciples, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Perhaps you are a non-Christian reading this and you are thinking, this is the exact type of thing I don't like about Christians. They're always so pushy and seeking to convert me. But I will kindly ask you to consider, is not everyone pushy about something? Some are pushy about their favorite sports team, political candidate, or faith in science professors. Others are pushy with their belief that you should not be pushy with your beliefs. Christians believe that there is great danger ahead for people who are not known by God. I humbly ask you to try giving this chapter a read with an open mind and heart and see what happens. The Elements and Goal of Contextualization The Apostle Paul lived in the first century. Paul saw Christ after he rose from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 8, and was sent by Jesus to share the good news of the gospel to the Gentiles, Acts 9, 15. These Gentiles did not have much understanding of the scriptures, which was the Old Testament at that time. The main biblical passage for this chapter is located in a letter that Paul sent to a church at a city called Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is talking about the rights he has as someone who spreads this good news of Christ as a primary vocation. He has the right to get married, 1 Corinthians 9, 5, and to take an income, 1 Corinthians 9, 6 through 12. But Paul notes that he personally decided, in his situation, to not take an income, 1 Corinthians 9, 12. Back in that day, professional orators would travel around seeking fame and fortune. Paul did not want anyone even thinking that he was doing what he was doing for those reasons. He knew he was free to take an income, but he decided not to in this case, and he joyfully served the people for no charge. He knew that, in this context, taking an income could discredit the message he was trying to bring. It would make people less likely to give him a fair hearing and evaluate the gospel message for the message's sake. What adaptability is not? Beginning in 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23, 
Paul addresses adaptability. He says he has become all things to all people, that by all means he might save some, 1 Corinthians 9.22. I have to be very clear. Nowhere in this text, and nowhere in the Bible, is there the slightest suggestion that Paul would ever change the content of the message of the gospel. There is only one gospel message. We never, ever, ever compromise or adapt the singular message of the gospel, Galatians 1, 8-9. A few chapters later, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-5, Paul describes this unchanging gospel message. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Paul says he wants to remind the Corinthians of the gospel that he preached to them. He says that they are being saved if they hold fast to that same gospel. The gospel is not fluid. He preached it to the Corinthians in the past, and they hold on to what he already preached to them. He says he received this gospel, he received it directly from Jesus himself, and he delivered it to them like a package. And the most basic content of that gospel is that Christ died for our sins and he rose from the dead. So the adaptability that Paul is referring to in our text is not a softening or changing of the central message of Christianity. Second, the adaptability that Paul refers to does not give him a license to sin in order to see people get saved. He does not start the drug dealing ministry for Jesus. He does not launch the white collar embezzling ministry for Jesus. He explicitly says he is under the law of Christ, 1 Corinthians 9.21. Third, this adaptability does not give Christians a license to turn the Lord's Day morning worship service into an entertainment show. When the early church met in Acts 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, what is now the Bible, the preaching and teaching ministry, the breaking of the bread, sacraments, fellowship, Christ-centered fellowship with each other, and prayer, Acts 2, 42. They were about worshiping God, not entertaining people. Paul says earlier in the same letter that Jews demanded signs and Greeks sought wisdom, but the apostles preached Christ crucified, 1 Corinthians 1, 22-23. He did not come with a show. He came with the gospel message, putting the glory of God on display. Certainly, some aspects of corporate worship can be adapted based on cultural context, the circumstances, but other aspects of corporate worship are based on biblical directives, which should not be changed across cultural context, the elements. Biblical adaptability. So what is proper adaptability? It is adaptability in external cultural matters. Paul says that he became as a Jew, 1 Corinthians 9.20. He became as one under the law, 1 Corinthians 9.20. He is referring to the ceremonial law of God. These laws commanded certain types of dress, diets, circumcision, and ceremonial washings for the physical nation of Israel, the ethnic Jews. These laws were to mark them off from other nations and typologically point to Christ and his gospel work. When Christ died on the cross, he fulfilled the ceremonial laws. Christians do not observe these ceremonial laws in the same manner. But we can participate in those things if we want to, as long as we are not trusting in them for salvation. If a married couple desires to have their sons circumcised, they are not in sin. They are free to do it. If they desire to avoid eating shellfish, they are free to abstain. Paul would use his freedoms in order to serve the Jewish people by giving up his own rights for the sake of not offending them. He wanted the Jews to listen to and understand the gospel message and not be distracted by something else. He did everything he could to not distract them. Elsewhere, Paul even circumcised his friend Timothy so that Timothy would not be a distraction from the gospel message, Acts 16.3. Paul also says in our text, To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, 1 Corinthians 9.21. Here he refers to non-Jews, Gentiles, those who were not involved in Jewish culture and did not know or care about the uniquely Jewish ceremonial laws. If the Jews would be offended if he ate a certain type of food, 
he would not eat it. But if he was hosting a meal for some Greeks, he would bring out the thickest applewood smoked bacon, figuratively speaking, and enjoy it to the glory of God. Paul would also adapt his vocabulary and communication style for those who were not familiar with the Old Testament scriptures and Jewish terminology. When he interacted with Jews, he would get deep into prophecy, typology, and biblical themes. Acts 13, 13-52 The Jews already understood general biblical terminology, like ceremonial cleansings, the temple, the sacrificial system, and feasts. But to Gentiles who did not understand those things, Paul changed his angle to present the same gospel message. In Acts 17, the Apostle Paul addresses Greek philosophers at a place called the Areopagus, a cultural center of religious and civil life in Athens. Think of a religious institution, university, and political organization gathered into one. What does he do in his interaction with these people? He does not assume they understand deep biblical language and communicate in a way that would go over their heads. He noticed an altar that had an inscription on it that said, To the unknown God, Acts 17.23. And through that launching point, he explained to them the true God, presupposing the truths of God's special revelation, Acts 17, 22 through 31. He even used some pagan Greek writers that his hearers would have been familiar with to supplement his explanation of the biblical truths he presented, Acts 17, 28. The apostles were not only concerned with getting the message across, they sought to serve their listeners by being wise and winsome in their communication. Describing Paul and Barnabas, Acts 14, 1 says, now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. The disciples cared about the way they communicated the message, not only speaking factually true statements. So Paul kept the message of the gospel the same and never claimed or spoke like there was an alternative ultimate foundation for knowledge outside of God's special revelation. But he changed his externals like his dress, diet, language, and communication style, depending on who he was speaking with. And why did he do all of this? Paul explains, To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. 1 Corinthians 9, 22-23 Paul did what he did not to be liked by other people, not to be thought of as cool, trendy, hipster, cutting edge, and certainly not woke. He gave up his freedoms and preferences in these areas for the purpose of seeing more and more people hear and understand the gospel message so that more could be saved from the wrath of God and enter into a joyful relationship with Jesus for the glory of God. He loved people, and he wanted them to know the real Jesus Christ and have infinite happiness in him. He wanted these new Christians to obey Christ in all areas of life and be used as spiritual soldiers for the advancement of the kingdom of God and redemption of all things. That is why he did what he did. Non-Christian reader, I am not writing these things to put you down as if Christians think we are better than you. We really do not think that. We are not Christians because we think we are better than anyone. We are Christians because we know that we are the worst and we know the punishment we deserve for our crimes against God. And we know the love, grace, and kindness that is found in Jesus Christ. He has rescued us with his perfect life, his death on the cross in our place, and his resurrection from the dead. He can rescue you too. Getting Practical with Contextualization It is important to get practical with this topic, so we are doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. James 1.22 what does contextualization look like in the year 2021 in a large metropolitan area in the United States? How do we serve people by becoming all things to them in order that we might see many get saved? Before getting to these examples, we must first ask ourselves, do I care about the gospel spreading? Do I care about non-Christian neighbors, coworkers, grocery store cashiers, mechanics, doctors, nurses, uncles and aunts, nieces and nephews? God cares very much that we care. We should be concerned about having proper doctrine and about loving other Christians. But God does not only want us to be concerned about our doctrine and taking care of each other. He wants us to recognize our identity as those who are sent into the world to spread the gospel. 
Holding to false doctrine is sin. Not loving fellow Christians is sin. And not being passionate about gospel advancement is sin as well. Remember what Jesus said? As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. John 20, 21. We also must examine whether or not we personally know anyone who does not know Christ. I'm not only referring to being acquainted with non-Christians, but actually being friends with them to a certain degree. A major misconception among Christians who believe the Bible is that healthy and mature Christians cut off connection with those who do not know Christ. We can start to believe that holiness consists of getting far away physically from non-Christians. We still work our jobs in the culture, go to the retail stores to shop, and go to the hospital for medical care. But sometimes we slip into the mindset that we should only interact with non-Christians when it is absolutely necessary. We can easily create Christian subcultures because it can be more convenient and more fun to do everything with Christians. But if we care about Christ getting the glory he deserves, if we care about gospel advancement, the next step is to get to know non-Christians. We ought to seek to love them in all ways, including speaking the gospel to them. 1 Corinthians 5, 9-10, a well-known passage on church discipline, says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Paul tells the Corinthian church not to associate with a person who says he or she is a Christian but is living in sexual sin. But then he clarifies that he does not mean that we are not to associate, mingle, or keep company with non-Christians in the world, since then we would need to go out of the world. The obvious conclusion of what Paul is saying is that we are to keep company with non-Christians. Be friends with them. Do all kinds of things together. Go out to coffee. Go to the mall. Invite them onto your softball team. Have them into your home for dinner. Invite them to the kids' reading club. Go for an autumn morning stroll. Pursue them as people and speak gospel truth to them because you love them. We are not to adopt the worldview or religious views of non-Christians. We should not worship their gods or be influenced by them to sin. So yes, be cautious and wise. Know what you can handle and where your temptations lie. Some are more prone to deception in certain areas than others. But get to know non-Christians. Ask them questions in love. We do not catch sin physically from other people. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, James 1.14, not by merely being around other people. Pray something similar to what Jesus prayed in John 17.15. Father, do not take me out of the world, but keep me from the evil one as I live, work, and play in the midst of non-Christians. Love non-Christians in all ways as fellow image bearers of God, and remember the urgency and primacy of speaking the gospel message to them so that they might come to know Christ. Faith comes from hearing, Romans 10, 17. And if they do not immediately trust Christ, do not necessarily move on from them right away. Did you get saved the first time you heard the gospel? Third, Christians should be living life in the culture. We should be generally familiar with the norms of the culture that we live in. Christians should not be weirdos who do unnecessary strange things like wear clothes from 50 years ago, avoid technology, or speak like we are living in 17th century England. Being involved in and familiar with our surrounding culture does not mean we are worldly. Being a Christian certainly impacts the way we dress, 1 Timothy 2.9, and speak, Ephesians 4.29. But being modest in our dress does not mean we have to wear clothes that are strange or ugly. Being upright and encouraging in our communication does not mean that we must use language that the average person in our context will find odd and hard to understand. It is not worldly to wear regular or fashionable clothes and to use understandable communication. It is not necessarily worldly to participate in the art, theater, and poetry of the culture. The whole world is God's world. Worldliness is sin. It is losing our distinctiveness as Christians as we participate in and seek to influence the surrounding culture. Worldliness is being conformed to the mindset of the culture and worshiping the same gods as the culture instead of influencing it positively for Christ's glory. Worldliness is, first of all, something within. We do not avoid worldliness by avoiding the culture. That is the air of monasticism, becoming a monk. 
The Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper commented on monks who retreated to the monastery in order to avoid worldliness. Retreating to the monastery might have been the solution if those who went out from the world had been able to leave the world behind. But we carry the world in our heart. It goes with us because no hermitage is so well fortified and no retreat in forests so distant, but Satan finds means to reach it. That is exactly right. We cannot flee sin by fleeing the broader culture. Mark 7, 21-23 Fourth, as we grow in experientially understanding the gospel, we will be more willing to give up our own freedoms and preferences for the sake of gospel advancement. We will have a greater willingness to become servants of others in order to contextualize. Are we mindful of how the words we say are understood by those who have not been exposed to Christianity? Am I willing to give up my rights as a Christian in order to see the gospel advance? Am I willing to give up what I prefer if it is going to give someone else a better opportunity to hear and understand the gospel and come to saving faith in Christ? Am I willing to change what I expect non-Christians to understand about Christianity, even if I prefer to use words and phrases like sanctification, propitiation, ordo salutis, soli deo gloria, and infralapsarianism without explaining them? Am I sensitive to who I am interacting with and the fact that many people might have no idea what I'm talking about? It is by no means sinful to use those words and phrases, but am I sensible to communicate in a way that others can understand, not merely caring about what I prefer? Am I willing to use an accurate Bible translation with modern language when I quote the Bible to other people so that they can understand? This biblical principle is what drove Martin Luther to translate the Bible into German. He did not believe that the Latin translation of the Bible was holier than a German translation. He wanted as many people as possible to be saved, so he made the message as accessible as possible. Applying this principle, Christians should be updating our song lyrics, Bible translations, and confession of faith versions in the modern language to make the message more intelligible. We should not be speaking 17th century English or sacrificing the understanding of our listeners for the sake of sounding intelligent. Am I mindful of the fact that God is the greatest artist and that he cares deeply about art, beauty, and excellence? Local churches should welcome and make great use of the gifts of artists, graphic designers, interior decorators, painters, and photographers. Am I willing to change clothing styles even if I prefer another clothing style? Am I willing to accept a different interior decor of a building than what I prefer if it could potentially remove obstacles from people giving us a fair hearing? Am I willing to change a website and the technology that I prefer to use, all for the advancement of the gospel that as many as possible might get saved? Our trust is in God alone to save people. But it is wrong to neglect the fact that God uses means in order to save people. Do Christian parents who discipline their children biblically not trust in God to save? Do preachers who preach the gospel not trust in God to save? Christian parents who discipline their children biblically are demonstrating their trust in God by using the means he laid out in his word. Preachers who preach are demonstrating that they trust in God by utilizing the means he has called them to. All Christians show that they trust in God to save by speaking the gospel, 1 Peter 2, 9, and by being willing to adapt in these external cultural matters for the sake of gaining as wide of a hearing of the gospel as possible so that as many as possible might be saved. Timothy Keller sums up this point. In areas where the Bible has left us free, when we carry out Christian ministry, we should be constantly engaged in cultural adaptation, refraining from certain attitudes or behaviors to remove unnecessary stumbling blocks from the paths of people with culturally framed perceptions. For example, we may need to refrain from particular music, clothing, foods, and other non-essential practices and concepts that could distract or repulse people from clearly perceiving the gospel. Christ the Contextualizer But we cannot end here. There is something essential to keep in mind as we consider this passage. What Paul did and explained in this text, becoming a servant, contextualizing and giving up his rights for the sake of gospel advancement, is nothing different than what Jesus did for us in the gospel and what he continues to do for us now. Jesus served you and continues to serve you in the same way. If you are a Christian reading this, I emphasize that he served you. This needs to be personal. This is not just good information to know, God help us. 
I pray that the Spirit increases your awareness of the great love of God for you personally as you look at Jesus. If you are not a Christian, I pray that you see and trust Jesus for the first time as you read this section. First, Jesus was sent for you. God did not wait for us to come after him. He did not say, if they really love me, they will come after me. No, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. He moved toward you despite everything you have ever done. Despite being his enemies, he went after us. Despite the fact that we were not fun people to hang out with, he went after us. Despite the fact that we were not, and still are not, practically righteous people, he went after us. Despite the fact that we did not deserve it, he went after us in grace. And this is not only in the past. Jesus still comes after us when we sin now. He will never stop pursuing us. Second, Jesus assimilated into the non-sinful elements of the culture out of love for you. He did not only become a human being in the physical sense and then wear unique clothes, speak a unique language that no one could understand, eat unique food, etc. He took on flesh and then willingly took on many aspects of the culture of the people he lived amongst, even though he may not have preferred that culture. He spoke the normal language of the culture. He wore the normal clothes of the culture. He worked a normal job in the culture for the majority of his life. He was a carpenter. He ate the same food and drank the same drink as the people in the culture. What made Jesus different was his holiness. It was his ability to maintain perfectly holy desires, attitudes, and behaviors in the midst of the culture and to influence the culture for the glory of God. In doing this, Jesus made his message more accessible and understandable to his listeners. And in his great love for you, he made it easier for you to understand the gospel and trust him by laying down the principles of 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23 in his word. The reason why you have the Bible in English is because of these principles. Do you realize how precious it is to have God's word in your language? We have to taste that kindness from God. How kind of God that we did not have to learn Koine Greek, Hebrew, or an angelic language before we could understand the gospel. Third, Jesus did what was uncomfortable to save you, Christian. He left his place of glory, honor, power, authority, riches, and blessing in order to become a slave, Philippians 2.7, so that you could become an heir, Galatians 4.7. For selfish people like us who all too often care more about what we prefer than about seeing non-Christians get saved, Jesus did what was very uncomfortable. He went through extreme temptation and he never sinned, living a perfect life for you. He was falsely accused for you. Although innocent, he was despised and rejected for you. He was mocked and beaten for you. He willingly went to the cross and endured the full punishment from God, the punishment that we should have received for the sins that we committed. No sin is too great or too regular to be wiped away by what Jesus did on the cross. He went to the cross for us weak, helpless sinners. He rose from the dead and is alive and well, ruling and reigning, working all things for the good of his people and making all things new. Jesus did what was uncomfortable. He is the true servant, laying down his rights in order to save people who will live in and transform cultures to spread the glory of God. Fourth, Jesus still serves you. He did not only serve us in the past, he serves us now and will serve us in the future. This is absolutely wild. We still sin all of the time, do we not? For we all stumble in many ways, James 3, 2. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, 1 John 1, 8. A few verses later, John says, If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, 1 John 2, 2. Jesus is continually forgiving you for the many sins you commit and will never stop coming after you, Luke 15, 4. He is relentless in his grace. If you are a Christian, you will not be left in the cold because Jesus will serve you into glory. Jesus will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 8. And it just keeps getting more shocking. When you get to glory, he will continue to serve you. 
Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. Luke 12, 37. When you taste this gospel, when you see Jesus for who he is, the one whose loving servant heart led him to contextualize, you will not be able to help but want to follow in his footsteps. We do not do this to gain any righteousness, but because we love and want to glorify him. We do it because we care deeply about other image bearers of God. Lord's Supper Meditation Some Christians with moralistic leanings might read this chapter and hear a subtle voice inside saying, Good, another way to build my righteousness resume. Or alternatively, Oh no, another thing on my list. I am overwhelmed. We will never be the evangelists and contextualizers that we should be. But the whole point of the gospel message we are trying to spread is that our righteousness before God is not dependent on how well we obey God's law, including the command to be spreaders of the gospel. So take a deep breath and rest in Christ. The body of Christ was broken and the blood of Christ was shed to save us who do not do this as we should. Christ, through his sacrifice, gives those who trust in him alone his perfect record. Christ brings you to God. Your skill in application and contextualization do not earn you a place at God's table to be satisfied with knowing Him. Jesus earned it for you. That is good news. That is grace. May God fuel us by those gospel truths to make us zealous to apply these principles for His glory.